it's it's bad though. I mean, okay. his situation is uncomfortable. I'm going to call the meeting to order and ask you to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic of America, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good morning. Welcome to the March 16th, 2021 County Commission meeting. I would remind you to silence your cell phone and the meeting documents are on the folder on the end of the counter if you'd like to look at that. If you need a listening device, you can check with Craig, who's in the back corner, and he could help you with a listening device. With that will move on to routine business. Item number one is a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Second. A motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. Item number two is approve the commission me meeting minutes from March 2nd, 2021. Is there a motion? Motion, motion to, to approve. approve. Sorry. Okay. I have second. a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. Item number three is bills to be paid in the amount of $5,611,800. Whoa, I got that wrong. $5,611,817.77. Pay the bills. Second. Motion and a second. Comments? Madam Chair? Yes. Uh, so these bills include, you know, it's a little higher number than we normally have. We're not even on. Go ahead. It's a little higher than we normally have. Includes uh, three million dollars uh, remitted to the state on motor vehicle and a million dollars for uh, the cooler, which uh, we put into our heating plant. Okay. Um, I have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. Item four is reports. Item A is the sheriff's reports from February of 2021. Item B is a register of deeds. Statement of Revenue for February 2021. Item C is the Highway Monthly Construction Project Update. Item D is the Minnehaha County Coroner's Report for January 2021. Item E is the Auditor's Financial Reports for February 2021. And yes, we have Kim here for an update. And I will remind all of you that all of our reports are on file at the Auditor's Office if you would like to look at them later. Good morning, Kim. Good morning, Commissioners. Um, I have two sets of reports to review with you briefly this morning. The first are the February operating results. Um, and we've got the cash reserves for the general fund standing at 29.8 million at the end of February compared to 10.5 million a year ago at this time. Um, the highway fund currently at 4.7 million compared to 11.4 million from a year ago. Um, and then we've got charts of our year-to-date expenditures. Our expenditures are trending, trending slightly behind where we were last year as a percentage of budget. That's due largely um, to the timing of payroll for the year. If you look at the chart specific to the personnel expenses, you can see we're at 15.5% of budget compared to 18.7 a year ago at this time. And that's because we had uh, more pay periods year to date last year than we've had so far this year. Uh, no other real concerns with where our expenditures are falling at this time. And on the revenue side, we are favorable uh, to, as a percentage of budget. We're at 6.3% of overall budget compared to 5.5% last year at this time. That's uh, partially due to property taxes coming in a little faster so far this year than last year. And the other area of interest is um, in other revenues, the fees from the Register of Deeds Office are trending well ahead of last year by almost, um, uh, we're at about $500,000 year to date this year compared to 300,000 last year. So the recording and transfer fees are way ahead of where we've been. Um, are there any questions about the February results? Questions? I guess not. Okay. Thanks, Kim. So then the next set of reports are the um, annual reports for 2020. We will be publishing our um, annual report following um, approval of this report. Uh, and the first 
uh, schedule that we have are, is an abbreviated form of our, our annual report that is published. And if you look uh, to the far right column, the total governmental funds column, you can see that we started the year with uh, reserve balances of 43.4 million, almost 43.5 million. We had total revenue countywide of 119 million, total expenses of 105 million. So we grew our fund balances by 13.8 million over the course of the year, ending at 57.3 million. Um, at the, as of the end, also as of the end of the year, our total outstanding debt is 61.4 million. That's predominantly the financing for the jail, along with some other older bond issues we've, we're still paying off. And lastly, our self-insurance fund at the very bottom of this schedule, you can see we ended the year with a reserve balance of 1.9 million. Do we have to approve this, Kim? It's not on my sheet. I'm sorry, it's not, it, it's not for approval. We're just okay. submitting it for your review, and okay. then it will be the published document as well. We're required to publish by, uh, by March 31st. Okay. Any questions for Kim on the overall analysis? Attached to this, we've also provided you cash flow analysis for all the government funds and a summary of the operating results specific to the general fund so that you can see where our larger variances to budget were in revenues and expenses. Um, I, if there are no questions about that, I, I'm finished with my report. Doesn't look like there is. So thank you, Kim. Thank you. We'll move on to item number five, which is personnel actions. Item A is consider a motion to approve routine personnel actions. So moved. Second. The motion is second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. Item B is authorize the chairman to sign the notice of the ICMA-CR for the county's in internment of transitions to another supplemental retirement plan provider and to sign notice of SDRS of the county's in intent to offer the Roth, the Roth 457. Thanks, Gary. <laughs> Good morning, Carrie Deaver from Human Resources. I'm asking for your approval today to start the transition of our retirement plan, our supplemental retirement plan from ICMA to SDRS. I presented a couple weeks ago about our committee's efforts over the past year to look at the lineup offered by both entities and the expense ratios. And again, I would just wanna send out my thanks to everybody who helped with that project. Um, I'm happy to bring this request forward to you. We think this is a great move for county employees. We did give employees a chance to, um, or sent out an email a couple weeks ago to let them know. Appreciate everyone who looked at that as well. Today we're asking for the formal approval to start the transition. It will take a while. It'll probably be about a 14 to 16 week process. It's gonna impact about 162 individuals, both retirees and county employees. Um, but we really think this is a good move to go to the new or to go to the plan with SDRS. Carrie gave us a briefing on this about two weeks ago, but are there any questions? Madam Chair. Oh, um, go ahead, Jay. So as you know, Carrie, I did get a, a concerned employee call me on this issue and uh, was worried that during the uh, transition from one fund to another that they would be selling low and buying high. Uh, that won't happen, right? What will happen is there'll be a two week blackout or blackout period where no longer contributions will no longer be accepted. And then um, during that period, we'll map over, the funds will be mapped over. There will be a one day period where those funds are actually trans transitioning. But you have to consider it this, this way. If your funds were with one entity and the market drops, it's gonna drop no matter where those funds are at. So the impact should be very minimal, if any. Thank you. Commissioner Bender. Well, I just would say too, I mean, that's very common practice. There's really no way around that. Anytime you, you make a change in a retirement plan, that's typically what would happen. Um, and so we can't make any guarantees about anything, but overall the move makes a lot of sense. Um, and we think it would be in the best interest of most employees going forward. So I would make a motion to approve. Okay, another motion, is there a second? Second. Motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. Thanks, Carrie. All right, thank you. Item number six is abatements um, considered for approval. Chris Lella. 
Good morning, morning Chris. Commissioners. Chris Lilla, Equalization. Yeah, we've got a we've got a number of uh, abatement requests here for you today. <clears throat> um, first one we'll jump into is item A um, is Wellington Township parcel number one three four two three. 2020 property taxes in the amount of $1,265. So this one is uh, an exempt entity purchased the property mid-year. So we're recommending approval of that abatement. Okay. We need a motion and a second and a roll call vote. So moved. Second. Motion and second. Roll call vote. Lydia. Aye. Aye. Bender. Aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. Uh, the next three items, B, C, and D, is South Dakota Department of Game, Fish, and Parks, parcel number 16610. 2020 property taxes in the amount of 521.88. Then South Dakota Game Fish and Parks, parcel number 16617, 2020 property taxes in the amount of $1,089.92. And South Dakota Department of Game Fish and Parks, parcel 16621, 2020 property taxes in the amount of $986.06. Again, this is an exempt entity that purchased mid year, so we're recommending approval of that abatement. Motion. I make a motion to approve Second. B, C, and D. And a roll call vote. Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Okay. Items E, F, and G are for First National Bank, parcel number 46856, um, 2018 property taxes in the amount of $440.88. Uh, same parcel number 46856 for 2019 property taxes in the amount of 465.68. And same parcel number for 2020 property taxes, um, four five excuse me, in the amount of $454.86. So this here was a drive-through lobby ATM that was torn down that we did not know about, and we have verified it was gone through our imagery and things. So um, normally they should get a RAS permit to notify us of that, but we are limited on how far back we can go. So it was actually gone multiple years prior to that. So, so we're recommending these three years for abatement. Okay. Motion. Second. <laughs> I'll make the motion. <laughs> motion a second. Roll call vote. Aye. Aye. Bender. Aye. 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 Items H and I, uh, pardon me if I mess this name up, Buise Safiet, it's parcel 74217, 2019 property taxes in the amount of $9.76, and then same parcel number for 2020, property tax in the amount of $57.30. This is a mobile home that unfortunately burned and they lost everything. So the $9.76 basically represents one month and then the next full year. Okay. So we're recommending approval. Sure. So moved. Second. Roll call vote. Aye. Aye. Bender. Aye. Aye. Berger. Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Item J, uh, Ryan Hander, parcel 13452, 2020 property tax in the amount of $1,303.60. This is a house that was removed off of the property and, and I believe destroyed. So we're recommending approval of this. So moved. Second. Motion is second. Roll call vote. Bender. Aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. And item K is an elderly freeze for parcel number 34937, 2020 property tax in the amount of $1,547.48. Uh, this one here was initiated through the through the treasurer's office. So I don't know much about it other than I know their value meets the value guidelines. So we're recommending approval of this abatement. I'll make the motion. Second. Motion and second. Roll call vote. Bender. Aye. Aye, motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Thanks, Madam Chris. Chair. Question yes. for uh, equalization. Yes. So our deadline for appeal is passed, correct? Yes, correct. Okay. So for, for local boards, for March the, 11th. The folks out there in the, that might be thinking about it, it's too late. Yep. yep we've had a few. So uh, on that note, too, though, um, just for the public and for commission, even if you missed the deadline, and if there is something wrong, please still reach out to us. If nothing else, we can get it corrected moving forward. And number two, if there is a... Uh, a massive error in your property, um, we as the Board of e or as Equalization Office can still make a recommendation or an assessor change for county board. So if we have a, have a serious error or omission or something like that, there is a possibility we can still get that corrected. However, it won't be handled as an appeal. You have no, the appellants have no appeal rights. Um, so if it's something minor like we were, had an extra toilet, we'll correct that moving forward. We're not gonna take the board's time to try and push that back now, but if you've had basement finish in your property and, and it's been removed due to flooding or something like that and it's still on the books, that's, that's a that's pretty a good, good amount of money. We, we want to get that corrected. So we will execute a, basically appeal our own value at county board on their behalf. So, Thanks, good Chris. Info. Good info. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thank you. 
Um, item number seven is notice of the request. Item A is a notice of construction change order number two for the highway project MC17-01, bid number MC20-02. I don't think we have to have any comments on it. It's just for notice. Item eight is planning and zoning notices. There are none. Item nine is petition for compromise of lien. There are none. Next, we have opportunity for public comment. Is there anyone here for public comment? I don't see anybody racing to the door, so we'll assume not. Um, we'll move on to regular business. Item number 10 is a briefing of the MacArthur Safety and Justice Committee from them um, on the acceptance of the MacArthur Grant. Uh, Judge Hallman and Aaron Sertzka. Good morning, ladies. Good morning. And company, I should I say. say. We, got, we got everybody. <laughs> we got everybody today. I brought my entourage. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Robin Hellman, uh, presiding judge for the Second Judicial Circuit. Uh, I know Aaron has submitted a wonderful PowerPoint that gives you a ton of information about the grant request today for uh, approval of the second cycle um, of funding. A lot of what is in here is material that I went over the last time I was here about six or eight weeks ago. So I want to just highlight some things that I think uh, would be important for your attention today and things that might be a little bit different uh, than when we, what we talked about the last time. As I mentioned when I was here last to give an update on the initiatives of the first cycle of grant funding and our plans for the second cycle of funding, uh, we believe that the rubber really meets the road in this second round of funding, particularly in the area and the goals of racial and ethnic fairness. Um, because COVID canceled a site visit that we had uh, planned, we were able to finish the first cycle of funding with a substantial sum, a fairly substantial sum of almost $180,000 of funding that was not spent from the first cycle of grant funding that we have planned now to spend during this second cycle in addition to whatever funding um, is approved for that second cycle. Um, these funds have been earmarked as explained on this carryover no cost extension uh, sheet here. And two of the things that I lead me to say that this is where the rubber really meets the road on the issue of racial and ethnic fairness are the two um, items that are listed at the top. And one of those is to fund a cohort of the Leaders of Tomorrow for justice-impacted individuals. And the second item there is a program of uh, mentoring and programming for mental health and substance use disorders through Urban Indian Health. And we have a couple of people here who are the leaders of each of those projects, and I want to give them an opportunity to come up and briefly tell you about uh, what is anticipated with those programs that have already been begun. And the first is Tamian Dysart from Think3D here in Sioux Falls. I'll ask Tamian to come up and talk about Leaders of Tomorrow. Thank you so much. Uh, so Leaders of Tomorrow was designed uh, to be a 12-week leadership development program here in the community, uh, specifically with the Justice Impacted Group. We wanted to go a little bit deeper um, with that. It's a uh, two-hour uh, course normally, but we have added uh, two additional folks, uh, Serene Thin Elk and Terry Liggins, to help uh, unpack the information uh, of these individuals through this cohort. The, there's three main uh, purposes of our Leaders of Tomorrow program is to empower and equip uh, these young leaders uh, to see themselves differently, to build their self-confidence. Uh, secondarily is to give them the skills that workplace development is desperately looking for, effective communication, uh, how to be a, a better team leader, et cetera. Uh, but the most important one, I think, probably in this is uh, community. Uh, a lot of times, especially with Justice Impacted, they get out, you have a lot of well-wishing uh, goals and ambitions, but when you go back to the same friend groups uh, out there, eventually they kind of pull you back into that. Being a part of the Leaders of Tomorrow community, we have over 130 graduates of the program that is emerging leaders within the community. And so having the umbrella of Leaders of Tomorrow Justice Impacted gives them access to other individuals who as well are uh, looking to develop themselves, empower themselves, and just giving themselves a different level of competence. Uh, we are two weeks into this program, and I can tell you this, the group that we have, uh, it is a clear difference where these folks can clearly see it's not just simply staying 
um, out of jail, out of prison, it's really seeing this is a pathway of success. Our mantra of Leaders of Tomorrow is building a pathway or building a ladder of success for those who are willing to climb it. And so when you can equip them and empower them to find the empowerment to, to build their pathway forward to be leaders and, and to quote one gal um, in, in class number two, she said, literally, this is gonna change my life because there was never ha has there been an investment intentionally made into them, helping them give them the skills, help them to believe a little bit deeper about what's possible in their life. And so Leaders Tomorrow is, is simply that of a 12 week course to empower and equip them. And it comes with a six month mentorship opportunity at the end of that to continue to make sure they have a pathway of success uh, beyond just the 12 weeks. Do you have any questions for Tamian? I just wish I had had pathway to success. <laughs> <laughs> Does Olivia need his name and stuff? Do you, have, do you, need, you have a business? Yes, Tamian, T-A-M-I-E-N, Dysart, D-Y-S-A-R-T. Thank you. And I'll tell you that Tamian, oh, sorry, Tamian is the um, co-chair, I would say, or vi vice chair of our Sioux Empire Leadership Council, too, and so next year he'll be the president of that organization. So, Commissioner Bender. Um, and thanks for serving in those roles. I was just curious when you talked about having this bigger community yes. of folks, is there intentional like gatherings of that group or how are they how are they put in contact with the, the past graduates of your program? Yeah, so now that we're coming out of COVID, um, there's there's quarterly uh, g networking events, gatherings, and, and as well as at each cohort, um, there's a graduation which we invite uh, past graduates as well. So again, there's about four broader gatherings uh, for them to get together. There is a online community for them to kind of engage with each other, reach out, support, um, meet up offline, uh, et cetera. And so they have that connectivity um, uh, with other folks within the community. Great, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Tamian. Robin, or Judge Hallman back. And now uh, we'll hear from Serene Thin Elk, who's involved in the Leaders of Tomorrow, as Tamian just explained, but is also um, at Urban Indian Health working on our initiatives there, particularly with uh, something called Generation Red Road that she'll tell you about now. Good morning, Kihani Wash Day. Um, my name is Serene Thin Elk, and I, I do work um, with Tamia, and I feel very privileged to be a part of the justice-involved um, individuals who are going through the, the Leaders of Tomorrow. I get the opportunity to kind of be a part of the program. I had heard about it, and so I sit in and I learn about it, but then at the second half is I'm able to meet with um, women. Right now, we only have one woman. We're looking at building up our, um, our programming to include more women. Um, but in particular, what's powerful about that program is it's they're getting leadership skills, but then they're also um, the second half learning to process things. So um, we're really working on um, building that emotional intelligence, which is key. We know that that is key in helping them to gain those life skills beyond, beyond the leadership skills. So just wanted to put a plug in for it because it's amazed and I, I, it's amazing. I'm amazed I'm telling people about it. So um, as you can see, we have at Urban Indian Health, uh, we really seek to provide um, kind of comprehensive care for anyone. A lot of people think it's just for, for Native people. That is our focus, but we, we really look at serving people who are socioeconomically disadvantaged as well. So um, with our programming and with this funding, we're able to actually fund a, a new full-time position, which is very much needed at our agency. Uh, we have an influx of people who are coming. We have a new executive director. We're building more behavioral health programming. And in particular, in our city, we don't really have that hub or that place for Native people that really focuses on culturally-based programming. So we're really proud to be building that. A part of that programming is our mentorship. We have a, what we call a cultural keeper. She's our elder in the community, and she knows um, traditional things that really, she's a gem. And, and so she's building programming where we are actually inviting in uh, and training cultural mentors. So we have some people who are gonna be working with youth and we also have other people who are going, going to be running ceremonies and things that we know are incredibly important for holistic health for our native relatives. Uh, we also have substance use, uh, we have outpatient treatment, we have individual sessions, we do treatment needs assessments and refer out to treatment. Um, and then really just focusing on trauma-informed care. So what we're excited about with building a new full-time position is this person is gonna be able to really take on 
um, a multitude of roles, including coordination more at the community and really serving more of our relatives because we do have, I can tell you I'm very busy doing the director role as well as seeing um, youth and really people of all ages that are coming in for our services. Thank you, Serena. Any questions for Serena on Urban Indian? <coughs> Thank so. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to Serene and Tamian for talking a little bit about their programs. Uh, the original impetus of the safety and justice challenge was a reduction in our jail population. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of information about the successes that we've had related to that initial goal. Um, the bookings by quarter went from a high of 5,231 to a low of 3,439 in the last quarter. A lot of that is obviously related a little bit to COVID, um, but we did see through the first cycle of funding um, a great reduction in uh, the jail bookings. And where I say again the rubber meets the road with racial and ethnic fairness is we've taken a dive into seeing how that breaks out racially in our community. So bookings by race, um, and this was uh, by month, excuse me, was 756. Bookings went down to 476 for our white population. Uh, that is accounted for 86.2% of the population in our metro area and results in 43% of the bookings. For Native Americans, our bookings went from 540 down to 378, which appears to be a good reduction in the, that number of bookings. However, Native Americans make up 2.8% of our population, but as far as bookings, they're almost 35% of the bookings in the county jail. For African Americans, those bookings went from 219 down to 204. They account for 6.1% of our population, but 15.87% of the bookings. So you can see that disparity um, in how uh, people of different uh, races and ethnicities are being booked into the county jail. So we're really hopeful with this potential second round of funding as well as the carryover funding that we'll be able to meet some of those needs that Serene and Tamian were talking about in our community, hopefully with the end goal of reducing the percentage of those uh, bookings and uh, providing quality services to um, folks of different ethnicities. Um, we also continue to refine our pretrial services to meet the goals of having people show up to court and not be rearrested. Since pretrial started in 2018, we have completed over 18,590 pretrial risk assessments over the course of those years. And we started the pretrial services division back in January of 2020. We continue to work on how those cases are opened, how they're closed, what reports are valuable, not only to the court, but to the attorneys who are representing those parties, as well as how our data is collected and reported. Since uh, starting the program, we've had 517 cases that were placed on pretrial services. Of those, 187 were closed, and 330 of those cases remain open, which means those folks are still on pretrial monitoring services. So as part of that uh, goal of getting people to show up for court and not getting rearrested, we're also going to continue our focus on sending out court reminders, trying to expand our ability to send court reminders to folks. And we also did um, just uh, launch a new application on the UJS website, which is ujs.sd.gov. And on the front page, we have a link to find a court date, and that allows anybody in the state uh, to enter their name and date of birth and find out information about every court date that they have, every case that is currently pending, not only criminal, but civil cases as well. So we're going to uh, continue to work on those efforts if the commission uh, approves the second cycle of funding. So I know that was really quick. It was uh, a lot of numbers. Do you have any questions? Commissioner Bender. I'm just, I'm curious about the UJS site that you just, yeah. do you need anything, do you need information besides your name? Like, do you need your social security Name number? and date of birth. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
I will say, I sit on this committee with the safety and justice challenge, um, and we meet every couple of weeks, and there's so many moving parts, it's really hard to pin down and tell you everything that's happening. Um, if Erin's back there, maybe she wants to introduce the rest of her staff. Sure. Um, if you would do that and just tell, because they came, and um, they're an important part of what's going on and um, doing a lot of work for us that we couldn't get along without them, too. So if you would just re introduce the rest of your people. Yeah, good morning. Erin Zerska, EUSD Family Med. And, yeah, we brought our team here. Um, we've been working very hard over the past year to kind of get some things together and keep all of the projects moving. We have Bridget Diamond Welch. She's our Associate Director of the um, Center for Rural Health Improvement and a WAVE. We have Shar Green Maximo, and she's our community engagement coordinator. And then we have Cl Clara Perscala, and she's our research associate too for our team. So we're really excited to be a, a part of this work and a part of the team as we move forward. And um, one other item just to note, so you heard about a lot of um, programming that's gonna be going on. So the next, as soon as we have the agreements all ready, we'll be bringing the contracts um, to execute those services here within the next few weeks to the commission for approval. So thank you. Any questions for Aaron? Okay, thank, thank you, you. Um, folks for all coming. This was just a briefing today, and then we will move on to our next item, which is 10.5. It's authorized the chairman to sign the MacArthur Foundation Grant Fund Agreement for January 2021. Make through a motion December to 2022. Authorize the chair to sign that uh, grant fund application. I'll second, Agreement, and I sorry. have a comment. A motion and a second, go ahead. I just want to I th want to thank all of you for the work that you've done. I also want to thank the MacArthur Foundation. I mean, they the money that they provide um, has done amazing things in our community already, and they allow us the opportunity to craft a plan that works for our community and um, address the issues that we have. And so, um, it's not you know while they have things that they're <coughs> promoting. Uh, they really do allow us to to come up with a plan that really works for our community, and we've we've seen that in the first round of funding. And I'm really excited to see what kind of great results we get out of this round of funding. I have a motion and a second to uh, accept the grant money. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. Again, thank you. Thank you yeah, for your work. Thank everyone. you for coming and slip sliding away out of here. I guess so. <laughs> um, that will move on to item 11, which is a briefing on the Department of Equalization. Chris, welcome back. Good morning again, commissioners. Chris Lilla, uh, Equalization Office. Um, our briefing here today, it's, it's very similar to the one we presented to you last year. Uh, it's just kind of give you a pre-run for our future budgetary requests and letting you as the commission know and the public know some of the duties of our office and what we do and why we do it. Uh, the first slide here is just a, our, our uh, oath that we do take, and, and it's, um, I'll just read that out. We do solemnly swear that we will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of South Dakota, that I will faithfully, impartially, and honestly discharge the duties of my office, particularly that I will assess all property assessed by me at its true cash value according to my best knowledge and judgment, so help me God. Now, uh, some that might be words, but... For me personally, I take that to heart, I, and, and I know our office does too. We want to do the best job that we can. We want to do it ethically, honestly, fairly, and equitably. So we put a lot of weight into our oaths. Um, we are a professional um, department with uh, professional duties, so um, not everyone agrees with what we do and how we do it and why we do it, and that's just fine, but we want to do the best job that we can do. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> Some of the things that we do is we maintain and update all county data. We assess all real estate property for taxation. We track and record all sales data. We establish growth and TIF increment values. We administer about 95% of the exemption programs. Um, and we also work with planning and development for future projects and reappraisals. As far as the department goes, um, we are the largest county in South Dakota with 188,616 people, just over 73,500 parcels. That's a lot of data to keep track of. That's land. Basically, every parcel is land unless it's a building on lease site. So not only do we keep track of the land, but we keep track of all improvements to that land. And so when you're looking at 73,500 parcels, if we looked at our improvements that we track, we're probably well over 500,000. I mean, when you've got a farm that's got 60 buildings on it, we have to account for each and every one of those buildings, as well as the land. So there is a lot of data in our office. 
Um, for each property, we keep a detailed working file that is updated any time a change is made. Some of the information recorded for each parcel is obviously the parcel number, the map ID number, which tells it where it physically sits, um, current property information and property history, all, associate, all sales associated with each parcel, sketches, property value history, all the program applications such as the owner-occupied elderly freeze, um, photos, which we'll be doing better on some of our folder, photos are quite old, um, and inspection notes. So the inspection notes are anytime the appraiser makes a visit to that property, they document what, why, why they were there and what they did. Um, next slide, <clears throat> 2020, uh, we're edging almost to 8,000 sales this year, just 7,800 and change. Not, not, not all of those, because of interest rates, not all of those are true transfers. A lot of those are refis, but every time there's a refi or a deed filed, we have to process that. So it is getting to be a lot. You know, uh, We only have one person in the office that execute those sales, so they are busy. Um, you know, We've remained fairly consistent at over 7,000 in the past few years. Um, one of the th takeaways from this here, and I won't read all of this, is to just look at the graph at the bottom on the right. If you look at 2018, um, our sales have, in, in 16, 17, our sales have remained fairly consistent. Um, the good sales, which would be, I guess, the one on the left on the bottom, the blue, those are the ones that we can use to analyze the market. So again, in 2020, you'll see we had an extreme amount of transfers but anything that's a refi, sold to a relative, not offered on the open market, those sales are rejected. We can't use those to raise or lower the market values. It's only the ones in the blue. So we've decreased a little bit in our good sales. But take a look at the amount of value increase that is occurring with these transfers. We exceeded a billion dollars of sales transfers this year. That is an enormous amount. Um, next slide. Um, so. We analyze each sale to determine if it's a good sale, if it's a bad sale. We look at the specific valuations in relation to its property characteristics and or land productivity. We annually evaluate the level of assessment in each taxing jurisdiction. We review sales data to determine market fluctuations and implement assessment adjustments accordingly. Layman's terms, we look at all the sales, we determine where and what is selling the, the best, the, the least, all of that. We make the applicable adjustments, whether it be at a neighborhood level, a property type, things like that, to keep us in compliance with state law. State law says that countywide I have to be assessed between 85 and 100%. Um, and, and I've talked on this with the commissioners a few times, but when we began this year, our level of assessment, so last year when we sent out our assessment notices, we were just over 90%. We roll forward a year, we haven't really done anything. We look at those values against sales and our level of assessment had decreased to 85.5. That means our market increased 5.64 from where we ended last year, countywide. That is a strong growth market. Again, at the end of the year, so 85.5 is my starting point. I need to stay between 85 and 100. I analyze all those sales in those neighborhoods and I drill down and figure out what areas need what adjustments. I make those applicable adjustments Again, targeting, I'd like to be between 90 to 94%. And we actually have an error on our ending assessment ratio down there. It says 90.5. My ending ratio for this year was 90.93. So we started at 85.5. I make the adjustments where they're needed. I put the new values back in, compare those to the sales, and recalculate a level of assessment, and we ended at 90.93. Yes? So I'm just I'm processing and listening how an audience might hear this. Um, and I'm curious how you would address, because I've heard from several taxpayers who've, um, whose property's gone up 30, 40%, and you just said the market's gone up 5%. Yep. So how, how do you, that's, how does that happen? That's countywide. That's taking all sales, throwing them in the bowl, saying here's our values as a whole on sales, and here's our values now. When I drill down into the specific areas, and especially this year with some of it is conversion from the old program to the new, some of it is we house typed. That was probably the biggest change where we broke all of our residential houses in olders, mid-aged, and newers, and we analyzed those. Um, we split our neighborhoods, so they were large, and I'll cover some of that in a little bit. We had overly large neighborhoods. We went down to smaller. We targeted 700 parcels. We have a few that are a little more, quite a few that are a little bit less. So the analogy that I use is if there's three of us in a car, one's going 50, or we all, one wants to go 50, one wants to go 75, and one wants to go 100. We've all been going 75 because that was the median. So somebody's been going 25 too slow and somebody's been going 25 too fast. I've split those neighborhoods out. 
into smaller groups, giving them their own cars. So the ones that want to drive 50, they're going to go down 25% because we're going to value them according to the sales more like them in a smaller geographic area. We house type them, so if it's an older, mid-aged, or newer. So with that <coughs> comes movement within the values. The values last year weren't wrong. It was just the study group and the way they were studied. This year, we, we have made good revisions to really focus and calibrate our models to apply the value changes where they needed to be. In most of those cases where a property went up excessively over 20% or so, most of those cases that I've found have been our older homes. And the reason is because they we run them against depreciation. So if you've got a 1930 home, cost you cost $180,000 to build new, we're going to take 60% of that value away because it's old and depreciated. We're down to 70,000. The problem is is it selling for 120, 130? Now I can make the adjustment just to those older homes to say, I'm at 70 and I need to be at 110,000. That's a big increase. When it was one big pool and they were blended with the olders, the mids, and the newers, and I'm throwing those, they say I need to go up 30%, the mids say I need to go up 8%, and the newers say I gotta go down four. When I average those all together, the average, I've only been able to go up 10% to everyone. Well, that's pushing the newers over. It's undervaluing the olders. Now, with our stratification and our data, I can apply the adjustments to particular house types and get more fair and accurate. So most cases this year, the increases were primarily to our older homes because we were depreciating the values so heavily and we weren't able to calibrate those back to the market and now we can. Thank you. <coughs> um, next slide. Uh, again, we are required by law to look at at every property uh, on a cost approach, an income approach, and a sales comparison approach. The cost approach is the foundation of what we do. We go out, we measure all the properties, we come back, we put it into our, into our CAMA system, which is the Computer Assisted Mass Appraisal ProVal. Um, we draw that property, we tell it how many bathrooms, how it's built, what's the grade, what's the condition of that property. That's the cost approach. Uses Marshall and Swift cost tables to give us a cost to construct that property new. Then, of course, we depreciate it. Once that's done, we go into more of a hybrid. We have our cost depreciated. Now we're going to compare that value to sales, and that's where I'm going to apply an adjustment at a neighborhood level to tell me, do I need to go up 5%? Do I need no change? Do I need to go down? That's where we're blending into the sales comparison approach. When it comes to the in income approach, it's primarily not for residential properties. This is for income producing. So they're always considered. Um, we use income on our apartments a lot. Um, we can use it on gas stations, things like that, if they would provide their profit and loss statements. But primarily, apartments is the main thing that we use the income approach for because we can directly um, capitalize their net income into a projection of market value. Um, growth, the next slide. Uh, you can see our permits have actually decreased a little bit since 2015, but we're holding pretty steady at just about just over 7,000 building permits. Again, take a look at the chart on the right. This is the growth. Even though our, our building permits are staying static, if you look at the growth, some of it is cost of labor and materials that have gone up with building permits. Some of it is just the overall value of the projects and construction that has been occurring in Minnehaha. We are just over a half a billion dollars of growth this year. That is new construction. And half a billion dollars may not seem like much, but it, it correlates to about a 3% growth. And if you're going 3% growth on 16, 17 billion of value. It's a lot of money. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of new construction. We are booming. Um, the next slide, again, as I'd mentioned earlier, we administer programs to help taxpayers reduce their overall tax burden. Uh, we stay up to date with changes in laws and programs. Uh, we are in direct communication with taxpayers in regards to their applications. Some of the examples that we facilitate is the owner-occupied application. Uh, elderly freeze primarily starts in the treasurer's office, but we're a component of that. Uh, discretionary formula, disabled veterans, renewable energy credit, religious educational charitable exemptions, agricultural exemptions, and just a host of other programs that we facilitate and manage within our office. So now kind of the meats and potatoes to pat ourselves on the back a little bit and ask you to give us more money in our budget request next year. Um, some of the things we've accomplished this year, we did finally complete their system conversion from AS400 to ProVal. All values are coming out of ProVal this year. It's not perfect yet, but we are getting there. We're getting much, much better. So that is a big, a big feather in our hat, especially to my staff. Uh, it's been 
a long 20 years for some of them, only a short couple of years for myself, but we finally crossed the finish line there. Again, neighborhood subdivisions, as I mentioned, we had overly large neighborhoods, particularly in Sioux Falls residential where we had 2,600 parcels in a study group in some cases. We're now down, we're looking at 700 homes to compare you against, to determine your value against sales, not, not the SLU. So that is a great advancement for us. Um, property type modeling, again, um, we broke our houses across the countywide into olders, mids, and newers. So now, if a new home sells in your neighborhood and you're an older, that new home sale is not impacting your value. You're only gonna be valued against houses like you in a smaller area. So again, more accuracy for us. Um, land conversion, for, we converted all residential land in Sioux Falls from front foot to square foot. We had quite a few anomalies hanging out there where land was, we had so many varying rates over 20 years. Um, a certain area was using $240 a front foot, then a block away, they might have been at 320. And here we had land that was the exact same size in the same neighborhood coming up with different values. So we've pulled all of that back and equalized land this year. Now if you have a 10,500 square foot lot and your neighbors and neighbors and neighbors do, you are all the same value in your neighborhood. There's no more uh, peaks and valleys within those. So again, it's a good platform to start our physical review. Um, and I think we're seeing some fruits of that. Um, a big one here, recalibration of our CAMA software, as I'd mentioned before. Our conditions were not functioning within ProVal. It, it just wasn't set up properly. So the, w the only way it depreciated was based on age. So if you had a, ten, a 2010 home and I had a 2010 home and we were the same, same age, same, same building, but yours was broken windows, holes in the roof, things like that, it didn't matter. We were the same value because we were the same age. Um, we've got that functioning within the software now to say, you know, my house has been well maintained and I'm average condition for my age, but your house is really dilapidated or, or falling in or in disrepair. We can go in there and adjust that condition now and give you more depreciation, which lessens your value. We never had that capability before. So again, another, another step for us. And as well as advanced mapping updates, um, we have put quite a bit of information out on the public mini map. Anybody from the public can go out there and click on mini map and turn on the sales and see the sales from this year, last year, and the year before, what they were selling for next to their homes. On our side in-house, we have a slew of data that the public doesn't get to see. We have more an analyzing. I can turn on the grades of the neighborhood, the ages of the neighborhood, um, the sales with the beginning ratios, ending ratios. You know, So my staff, we've given them a lot of tools to really delve into the, into the GIS mapping and utilize it to its fullest extent. Goals for next year, um, which is the next slide. We planned on starting our physical review this year. Uh, we are pushing that back due to COVID concerns, not only for my staff, but for the public. We're, go we're, we're gonna be going door to door to door to door to door when we do that, and hopefully uh, the public allowing us inside to inspect their property and make sure our data is true and accurate. That was a concern not only for my staff, but we don't want to be a spreader of going door to door to door if we pick something up. So we've, we've rolled that back. We're gonna push that back a year, but in, in lieu of that, we are going to be doing a desktop review this year, which means we're gonna be looking at trying to get through the county as a whole, but we're gonna be starting at each neighborhood. We're gonna be looking at consistency of grading to make sure that the same house in two different ones is the same grade. Are those conditions right? And we can only base that on the current data that we have but we've got some, some quality variances as well where we find two houses that are the same house and one is a good and down the road is an average and it's the same house. It's just the length of time of when that data was collected by appraisers that are probably no longer here, the, the thought processes, the criteria, I don't, just a multitude. It's time to bring all the cats back in and get them herded in one corral. So we're gonna be doing that. Um, updating cost tables, this is something that was not on my agenda to do. It wasn't on my forecast um, <clears throat> until this year's market analysis with our conversion of our final. Some of our, again, we, we value the, uh, each property or each improvement at its cost to build it new and depreciate it. And then I have to apply a factor to that to get me back or to be in compliance to get me into that sales range. And I'd like to again be at 90 to 94%. So there's a number that gets applied, and that's the increase or decrease. Um, this year, I've got some factors now that our cost tables, I have to factor my cost new depreciated, I have to factor them 1.8 or 
So my, my number is 184. When that number gets close to 200, we have to put on new cost tables. We have to update the cost tables. So that's something that popped up that wasn't really on my horizon, um, but we're gonna do that for both commercial and residential this year. What the public won't know and won't see is right now, if you had a $200,000 house right now on your assessment notice, and let's say in May and June, I put on the cost tables, I fully expect the cost, the starting point of that house to go up 30 to 40%, which means 200,000, you're gonna, mid-year the public won't see it, but it's probably gonna jump a $200,000 house up to like 260, because it still has that 180 factor. What I then have to do is then pull reduce that factor to get that value back down. So my 180 factor will probably go down to a down to a 110 factor or something like that. So it'll be hidden to the public. Nobody will ever know it. And then that will be kind of the starting point and we'll analyze that end value against sales next year. Um, next big thing is the transition from AS400 for the tax side of things into ENCODE. That one should not be too bad. Uh, it's already been done. IT already takes our values from AS400, puts them into ENCODE, so that our values actually roll down to the auditor and down to the treasurer. So that's already done. There's just some tweaks that I have to do in there to, to for our office to fully utilize it. I have to set up our discretionary formulas in there, our ag exemptions in there. Um, just a little setup. It isn't too bad. I, that's not a, 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 big, a big mountain to climb there. Um, we ran out of time this year, so we're planning on splitting all of our townships, again, kind of neighborhooding them into the ag parcels, the acreages, and then any developments, like I, I'll use Split Rock. There's a lot of developments out in Split Rock where they're residential developments in a country setting. You know, you've got 40, 50 homes. Well, we're gonna, we're gonna neighborhood those, so those sales in those will not affect the acreages and will not affect the farms and vice versa. Uh, we just didn't, didn't get that all done this year, so that's on the to-do list. Um, we're gonna finish equalizing the land rates again. We're gonna be looking at all the townships and the small towns for sure, we're gonna be converting those to square foot. I don't think we have the anomalies that we had in Sioux Falls, so it should be pretty clean. In Pure, there shouldn't be much value shifting there. Um, but we won't know until we get into the data. And then we, obviously we need to maintain our building permits that we get and if we've got 8,000 building permits out there, we've got a lot of work to do. And lastly is we need to update our new soil table ones. So this is gonna impact farmland. Um, Department of Revenue is going to a new statewide soil survey. Um, we've actually had it in-house. They gave the counties three years to implement that. Um, we're coming on our second year. Last year when we received the GIS layer for that, um, we were too deep and too much going on to even attempt that. So we put that off. So that is on the docket to do this year. Um, I don't know what that's gonna do. I, again, there, there could be a value shift to individual farmers that have certain soil types that are gonna change and the ratings are gonna change. I won't know, they want me to kind of report my beginning and then my ending and see where those changes are to see, and I'll have to give that back to Department of Revenue and they'll take a final look at it to see if there's an adjustment that needs to be made. Their plan right now is to say we have, for like our crop soils, $3,926 an acre. That's, that's the most I can be on this current soil survey. When I put the new one on, if that is going to drastically increase the, the total value of a property, what their plan is to do is to adjust that top dollar. Maybe that'll go down to 2,800 to bring everybody back in line. So that's kind of their plan right now. Um, I'll have more to come on that when we delve into that, but a busy, a busy year ahead of us. Thanks, Chris. Any questions for equalization? Let uh, Jean go first. I'm just curious, you know, with the changes that you've discussed, and obviously you and your staff are quite busy this year, how the appeals look? Are they similar to what you've seen in the past, or? Way less. Way less, okay. Yep. As a matter of fact, today we are starting our, our local board. Yesterday I met with the city. Uh, we did our, our uh, good sales, which in the past, you know, the, just a couple years I've been here, we've had 60, 70, 80 good sales. Um, I think we had 16, which means that people have now paid more for their property than their current assessment within this past year. And those that did, they're not much. When I first came here, they, they, I mean, we had like 60, 70. So our values are getting more accurate and we're hitting that market. And there's always gonna be some that, you know, I have to put everybody in a bowl. There's always gonna be somebody that got a good deal on a property and my value now against the model is, is over and, and vice versa, some are gonna be under. Um, they paid an extraordinary, extraordinary amount of money for a property we didn't 
think was valued that high. So there's always those outliers. Um, as far as residential appeals in Sioux Falls today, we are done in one afternoon. We've got 21 appeals to hear. Commissioner Burr. Thank you. For residential. We've got, I think, about on Thursday, I think right now we have eight commercial in Sioux Falls. Uh, it, within the towns and townships, we probably have about 25 total. So we are much lighter this year than I've, than I've seen since I've been here. So I have a couple questions, I guess. <clears throat> Is there undiscovered value out there that we don't know about, like finished basements? I mean, people that have errors where you think they have a basement and they're a slab or whatever, that's one thing. But what about the undiscovered? And uh, what does it take for you to find that? Is it just Physical reviews. Yes, I'm, I'm certain every, every year there is undiscovered value out there. Uh, people, especially basement finishes, and, and I know Sioux Falls is really good with their code enforcement and, and building inspections, that, and people know, but there's still ones that we stumble across that all of a sudden we see a sale come across our desk. You know, we thought it was worth, you know, 270000 It sells for 330000 and we look at the listing on that, and here it's advertised, recent basement finish, full remodel, and there hasn't been a single building permit taken out for that. So we monitor those sales, and we try and go out and look at those um, as much as we can, but if it doesn't sell, we're still missing it. The other thing I would point out is that uh, with the abatements that we had today, there were several that were government entities and stuff, and every time we take something off the tax rolls, everyone else is paying more taxes. and. Uh, you know, there's quite a high percentage of land that is owned by the government, including uh, the city of Sioux Falls, way out in the country. Um, at, uh, uh, I'm just complaining. Okay. No more questions. Thanks, Chris. And at the beginning of Chris's um, presentation, he said, if you have any questions, make sure you stop up in the office and ask, and I will or tell you that call. there's... Their staff is very helpful, very knowledgeable, and um, they are willing to help you very patiently. So, good group of people up All there. All right, thank so, you. Thanks, Chris. That will move on to item number 12, which is a briefing of the Agda Business Pillar, Holly Rader. Oh, she's right there. I'm looking at the door. Good morning, Holly. Hi, how are you? Well, thank you again for having me this year. Um, earlier, Commissioner Barth asked me how long I have been doing this, and this is my fourth presentation to give y'all. I've been um, with the Greater Sioux Falls Chamber of Commerce for three and a half years now and have the opportunity of serving as the Chamber Staff Liaison uh, for the Agribusiness Pillar, which is a new term that I will hit on next. Um, agribusiness pillar along with Greater Sioux Falls Chamber of Commerce is both new um, from when I spoke to y'all last time what used to be called the agribusiness division of the Sioux Falls area Chamber of Commerce so a lot has happened in a year um, lots of name changes but just like um, the divisions were from um, our chamber bylaws uh, pillars also serve as voluntary associations of members who desire to work together as a group for the purpose of more effectively promoting a special industry, a business, um, an activity, or a profession. So there are four pillars within the Greater Sioux Falls Chamber of Commerce, agribusiness being one of them, what I'll be speaking with you today. Um, Experience Sioux Falls is one of those as well, um, which hits on the tourism industry, and Business Leadership Council, and the newest pillar of the chamber is diversity, equity, and inclusion. And um, I get to talk to you about agribusiness. So the agribusiness pillar, of the Greater Sioux Falls Chamber of Commerce advances and promotes the Sioux Empire as an agricultural center through actions that provide a higher visibility of the industry, just like what the bylaws tell us to do. <laughs> so um, some of those actions, actually most of our actions serve as annual events or initiatives. And on the next slide, we have three very signature annual events. Am I the one controlling this? I am so sorry. She oh, I can control away. it. You can do it. You can okay, do it. perfect. Yep. <laughs> um, I didn't do the first one, so I didn't know if that was me or not. <laughs> so um, those actions serve primarily as events, as I just said. Um, three that are very signature, National Farmer's Day at the Barn, the Sioux Empire Livestock Show, and Ag Appreciation Day, um, which is in conjunction with the Sioux Empire Fair, and it is a luncheon that is put on by our volunteers. Um, speaking of volunteers, 
all three of these events, as well as all the other initiatives that happen throughout the year, would not be possible without um, those voluntary associations that I spoke of that are from the bylaws. We have the best volunteers in the world, I would say. Um, so now I'll hit on um, just all three of these events, and um, if there's any other questions about any other initiatives throughout the year. Um, I know I only get seven minutes, so I'll speak quickly. Um, <laughs> so this past October, we celebrated our third annual National Farmers Day at the Barn. This event happens traditionally for the past three years at the Stockyards Ag Experience Barn, which is down in Falls Park. And the true mission of this event is to bring our consumers to the barn and to tell the story of agriculture. And it is a family event. We encourage kids to come uh, pick up their pumpkins. And while picking up their pumpkins, this year was a little different than others in the past. We usually have an activity and get to talk to them about where that pumpkin comes from and just try our hardest to put in a little bit of knowledge um, here within the city of Sioux Falls and uh, make sure that it's a fun, fun family event um, near harvest. And we talk about um, basically why farmers aren't able to be here right now and it's because they're usually um, out in the fields harvesting so that we can eat year in and year out. <laughs> um, this year was very different in a lot of cases when it comes to events. We still were able to put on our third annual event and um, just had a lot of precautions in place, but still had an opportunity to tell the story of agriculture. The 68th annual Sioux Empire Livestock Show just wrapped up there at the end of January. Um, 68 years of tradition, it's, it's quite something. I've only been a part of it for four years. <laughs> um, but a lot has, has come into this show in the past four years, and a lot of tradition, all of the tradition stays true. So speaking of volunteers again, we have nearly 200 volunteers that dedicate th themselves to that week, and those come from businesses within the community. A few highlights from this past year's show is we were one of the only shows in the nation um, at our caliber to continue to have our show. And um, with that came a lot of, of tough decisions um, on what we were going to have within that week-long event, which was extended. Our dates did extend so that we were able to accommodate the numbers we were expecting um, in a safer manner. And um, also, we were able to host um, nearly 3,000 families in the city of Sioux Falls throughout seven days. And from an economic impact standpoint, um, working for the chamber, we have to think about that, as you know. Um, we, it was really something um, that our community still came together to be able to highlight agriculture in a way that we do annually, but really be able to showcase that to more people this year. Um, with D the Denver Stock Show not happening, and um, also Arizona National and Fort Worth, those are some national um, livestock shows that happen around the same time as the Sioux Empire Livestock Show every year. And because those canceled, um, they came to Sioux Falls. So it was, it was quite a task, um, but we were able to get it done. And um, we had well over 10,000 in attendance um, there with our trade show that goes on, all of our cattle sales. Um, and I can't forget to mention the Mayor's Roundup and Sell of Champions, which was also a great success this year. Um, the business community came together to bring in over $60,000 for the future of agriculture. All of the, that goes to the youth exhibitors that are there showcasing their livestock projects. Also, we're able to bring in over $10,000 of scholarship, scholarship funds, um, and we had the opportunity of representing over 25 states this year. So those are just some fun facts. <laughs> um, so then I can't forget to mention Ag Appreciation Day, which happens annually at the WH Lion Fairgrounds Grandstand. Um, this past year was very different as well. I'm actually telling you to save the date uh, for our 38th annual, which is in August on the 11th. Um, but this, this past year, we were still able to appreciate agriculture um, with this traditional event. Well, a lot of precautions were put in place um, more than ever before again. Um, but with the Sioux Empire Fair Association continuing to have their event, um, we were able to implement a lot of great um, protocols and um, procedures for all of our businesses to be able to still come out and, um, like I said, recognize our hardworking farmers and agriculturalists in our region. So um, 
We didn't have nearly the numbers that we used to have this past year. We had right at 1,000, um, which is still pretty impressive. Um, and looking into this August, we hope and we know that um, things will look a little bit better with um, all the vaccinating and um, all of all of the advancements that have come since this last August. So we are very optimistic about um, August 11th. I hope that all of you um, commissioners can make it if you are, so want to. Um, that's why I had to say the save the date there. <laughs> um, so in addition to promoting and advancing the ag industry through our actions, um, we also, as, as a group, have the opportunity to partner with many other organizations within the community and the region, and um, we're able to, to just bring together um, maybe the gap that there is within urban and rural society. And um, as I know, you all know, I really enjoy what I do, and um, I have the opportunity of serving as an ag cheerleader for this region, and um, some of those um, other partners or organizations that we work with. Sioux Empire Fair is one of them. Um, we also have South Dakota Ag in the Classroom, Groundworks, uh, Stockyards Ag Experience, and um, Ag United for South Dakota. And even from a government standpoint, we have the opportunity of um, helping promote agriculture. We are a part of the Governor's Ag Summit this year, which will happen on July um, 8th and 9th. And I wanted to throw that out there too. I'll be emceeing, so if you want some entertainment, come on out to the <laughs> district. <laughs> um, but with that, I did that pretty fast, and I, I usually do, but I want to be uh, respectful of time. If you, any of you have questions that you would like to ask. Madam Chair, you know, I think that uh, in the four years since we first met at St. Patrick's Day, um, your smile hasn't changed, but your Texas accent maybe has it's faded. Faded. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Holly, for coming. Holly is kind of a one-man or one-woman band. She works really hard, and and yep. and just your information on your annual Sioux Empire Livestock Show. I was gone during that period, but the amount of people you hosted in states is impressive. So thank you very much for your hard work, and thank you for our agricultural community that you continue to support what we do here in Minneapolis County. So thank, thank you very you. much. Good to see you. Thank you. Item number 13 is a briefing on the Glory House by Mr. Johnson. Madam Chair, Commissioners, thank you for uh, allowing me to be here. Um, to start with, I think we, <laughs> we all know all the challenges we've all faced um, with the COVID. And sitting in a communal living center has been especially challenging and I think uh, all of us in this industry uh, has had to really do some things that has tried to keep our clients safe, our staff safe, and the community safe. So I, I just went through a little bit of a, a listing of some of the precautions that had to be put into place um, and some of the things we had to do. Trying to keep up with what was going on uh, both internally and in our community uh, in terms of the pandemic uh, really created some challenges. Our staff and our clients both, though, kind of rose to those challenges, and uh, because of this, some of the things that were going on that people were able to do, uh, we were fortunate enough not to have hospitalizations or deaths related to COVID, and uh, ultimately that was our goal. Uh, we did, obviously, uh, uh, drop our residential numbers, we closed down some of our businesses for uh, pieces of our businesses for a couple months. Um, all those obviously have an impact on on our agency's uh, fiscal well-being, but we we're also able to apply for and did receive some PPP dollars, which has maintained us as we move forward. Um, the 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 challenges for our clients uh, was pretty significant. Um, Many, uh, the vast majority of our clients lost their jobs during this time. Mm -hmm. um, and many were um, obviously in a very vulnerable position. They were kind of, uh, as an accredited treatment facility that's largely supported by criminal justice clients, um, they were literally a captive audience. 
and they were put in, in, in a tough situation of communal living uh, and, uh, and trying to maintain sobriety and uh, trying to re maintain their, um, just their, their well-being. Um, over the course of the year, we've seen a spike in, we saw a huge spike in terms of substance use, of uh, mental health issues, of um, just a lot of frustration. Um, going through this, though, our clients also came out the other side. It, uh, people are doing better. People are, um, as we know in Sioux Falls, um, there's lots of employment. They have, uh, the businesses have opened up and have welcomed our clients uh, back into their workforce. And, um, and they continue to do pretty well as of today. Um, now with the vaccines rolling out, uh, obviously our staff and clients both are encouraged to uh, um, at least consider that and um, the majority of both have done so. So those are some of the, the, the dealings that we have had to uh, cope with as we went through the, the pandemic and as we continue to um, reduce our own numbers, slow down our, our uh, community access points, and, and do those sort of things. And we will continue to do th those things until, until we don't need to. So it could be a little while. Um, next piece I had mentioned was the, was the uh, departments. As all of you know, the, the county uh, was good partners in, in helping us uh, move forward. Um, we've been running about an 80% capacity, which is a little bit lower than what we want, uh, but there's a lot of factors uh, that played a part in that. Um, we've also found out uh, as, a, as, a, as a new landlord in the community how hard it is to uh, encourage people to uh, maintain a, a drug-free lifestyle in that sort of environment. Uh, it, uh, trying to create that community lifestyle within an apartment uh, complex is challenging. And it kind of comes and goes with depending on who our tenants are. But as uh, we've seen, uh, the more work we put into creating that community feeling, the better off our clients are and the more receptive they are to, uh, to see the options other than using uh, alcohol or other drugs. Um, we did uh, 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 fall short of our capital campaign goal during the COVID uh, uh, pieces, uh, uh, not by a lot. Uh, we were fortunate to have a lot of really uh, strong donors step up and help us as we uh, move toward that finish line, but we still did fall a little bit short. And uh, we'll continue to work on that uh, 1.34 million as we go forward. We, do, we are in the process of, uh, mm, early process of sketching out what the next building phase is actually gonna look like. As you can well imagine, everything just stopped. And, um, and so we are moving forward with some of those plans and uh, the board of directors and uh, our other partners, uh, uh, we're all working together to uh, probably, um, probably look at May or sometime in 2022 to actually begin construction. So um, the other thing that we have uh, focused on this, uh, this past year and this year as well um, is to spend more time with trauma-informed practices. Um, it's been something that's been kind of a passion of mine for a long time, and uh, we are able to move forward and help our clients understand that relationship between uh, trauma and addiction and mental health issues. Um, one of the key pieces uh, that we have also been very much involved in is creating uh, a stronger case management type of services. Um, in, anywhere from um, uh, 
you know, nutrition needs, transportation, uh, medical care, uh, pharmaceutical care, um, uh, all those sort of things our clients need. And it, particularly as we've gone through the pandemic, those needs have become even more pronounced. So we've been able to add on uh, more case managers to help uh, support those services. And not only within the uh, treatment facility, but also in our apartment complex. So those people have all the support services in place as well. And then um, finally, I just mentioned the client employment piece. Um, as I said, most of our uh, clients actually lost their jobs almost immediately. And some of them were unemployed for months. And of course, that, that created all sorts of stressors on them, uh, as well as uh, their families. Um, with things opening up and with our, uh, you know, our strong employment base in Sioux Falls, um, pretty much if you're willing to go out and look for a job and you're willing to put in the effort, you can find a job. And most of our clients welcome that opportunity. And uh, so most that can actually have jobs, they do have them. So we're trying to fill that gap in the community of providing employment. This, this, uh, this year, uh, as we move forward, uh, we know that there's gonna be some challenges that we're just gonna have to deal with ongoing and trying to be nimble in our response is gonna be key. Um, as I talked about COVID, you know, we've really enhanced our ability to provide telehealth and it's been a key piece of what we've been able to do. And I don't see that going away. Um, we need to be able to reach out and provide services for people where they're really at. And, uh, and that's something that we'll continue to expand on. Thanks, questions? Dave. Questions? Well, I'm, you, you got the, you're maybe the second or third person today to use the word trauma-informed practices. And I'm just wondering if you could give like a one-minute summary of what that means. Well, I, I think one of the, certainly I can, and thanks for asking the question. Um, what it really means, at least from our agency perspective, is that we help our clients and our staff to better understand what sort of uh, things has happened ongoing uh, to our clients and perhaps look at how they coped with some of those events. Mm -hmm. for, for many of our clients, um, uh, addiction, mental health issues, things like that have been a coping mechanism. And that's, what, and that's what helped them survive some of those trauma issues. So if you take a look at it through a, through a coping mechanism uh, piece, then you can start taking that apart and help them realize that how I used to cope with something when I was 25 and drinking heavily and putting needles in my arm, is in a very functional way to really cope with some things. So we help them understand what happened, why they were doing what they were doing. We don't shame them or, or um, beat them up for being an addict and then help them come up with healthy ways to, to deal with life. And so it's really an important piece, not only for our clients, but our staff as well. They, you know, they need to understand that all these, all the behaviors we're seeing and all these things that are happening within our clients, there's causes for those things. And it doesn't make sense maybe for me to put a needle in my arm, but for our clients at certain parts of their lives, that might have been the best they can do. And it's our job to help them understand that and hopefully get them to live their best lives possible. That was probably longer than a minute. That's good. Commissioner Burr? Nope. Um, with this uh, new COVID uh, relief bill, are, are you able to uh, get any funding from that? Well, I'm, I'm doing the research on it and I have a couple other our partners that are doing some research on it. I think we're going to be able to, but I haven't really found the line in that uh, that says that we will actually qualify or not. That's good, thank you. But we're, we're looking. And Dave, thanks for what you do. Um, are most of the people that are involved in Glory House criminally justice, criminal 
activity involved people that come to you through that system that they step out of ours and then end up in your place or are there people from off the street that they decide we're going to go this direction the majority are somehow uh, tied into the criminal justice system there are some that just show up and need help um, and that's fine we are credited we can do all those things but the vast majority is going to be through the criminal justice system yeah. Yeah. One more thing you mentioned was the telehealth, and you think about where we were five or six years ago with telehealth, and it was just starting to come out, and boy, this last year, even our meetings going through Zoom and whatever other platform you're using, but telehealth has been a huge, had a huge impact on how we can um, reach people in our community, so. Absolutely. Yeah, so thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for the opportunity. All right, we'll move on to item number 14, which is consider a motion to declare various jail capital assets as surplus. Mr. Matson. He's only waited an hour and a half. Good morning, Commissioner. We're still happy to have him. How's everybody today? Great. Um, <clears throat> yes, I'm here to talk about some of our jail capital assets and have them declared as surplus, and with a couple of them getting transferred to facilities. Um, I wasn't quite sure how you want me to do this. Do you want me to read through the list? Um, um, I don't know that we think need. we could. If we have any questions, we can yeah, ask them. I don't think Obviously, we need to read yeah. through the list. Maybe just uh, we have some items to be disposed of, and item A would be disposal and recycling. Is there a motion? I'll make a motion to dispose as suggested. I'll second that. I have a motion is second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed. Oh. Roll call. Oh, sorry, you're right. I'm looking right at it. Roll call vote, please. <laughs> Aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. And I will say, if somebody really wants to see those, those are all available on, in our weekly documents. So um, the next one is to transfer for transfers to uh, department facilities departments. Do you want to speak on that one? I'd be happy just to make a motion to okay. transfer. I think it's pretty self-explanatory. Yep. So I, I can say that um, JDC was very happy to get that generator yes. from the correction center. Yep. I'll second Jean's motion. Okay, motion is second. Roll call vote. Bender? Aye. Sparks? Aye. Highberger? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Thanks for coming. Thank you much. Um, you. Item number 15 is authorize the chairman to sign a renewal agreement to provide human services casework to Lincoln County. Jamie Phillips, or is he here? Or he is on the phone. So, Jamie, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Good morning. Good morning, Jamie. This is Jamie Phelps with uh, Human Services here, County Human Services. Thought I'd pop in just in case you had any questions on this item. Uh, basically, this is uh, the contract is going to, the agreement is going to be unchanged, uh, outside of the fact that the annual increase is taking place for the Lincoln County caseworkers' uh, salary and benefits. And I uh, plan on taking this over to the uh, Lincoln County Commission next Tuesday. Any questions for Jamie? Okay. And make a motion to approve. Second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. Thanks, Jamie. Item number 16 is briefing. Thank you. Briefing on the March 16, 2021, Minnehaha County Alcohol Beverage Compliance Checks. Olivia. Thanks, Olivia. Good morning. Um, in late February, the Sheriff's Office conducted an alcohol compliance check which um, five licensees failed. Of those five, one of them was licensed by Minnehaha County, which is MTZ, or, sorry, MZT LLC DBA Pump and Pack. Um, they have not had a violation since June 2007, so I would say that's pretty good. They do have to do a public hearing at their renewal time, which will be this spring. We'll most likely get their application sometime in April, May, and then have to hold a public hearing. So. Yeah, I'm sure. Sorry, uh, did they have a violation in 2007 or is that when they came into existence? They had a violation in 2007. Okay. And we have the Sheriff's Office here. If yep. anyone has any questions? I don't think so. I think you're off the hook. Oh, thanks for coming though. Yeah, yeah. thank <laughs> you for coming over. Um, and this is just a briefing and like Olivia says, we'll be addressing this later in the spring. Mm -hmm. So if there's no questions. Olivia won't be here. Olivia won't be here, that's okay. Without, um, with no questions, we'll move on to the item number 17. Thank you, Olivia. Item number 17 is consider a resolution to request partial termination and release of grounds lease. 
Auditor. Yes, good morning, Commissioner. Ben Kite, Auditor's Office. So yes, the resolution before you today is um, related to um, the ground lease that we have. Most of our property, or not all, most of our property, some of our properties in the uh, county are encumbered through um, bond issuances. Um, one of those issuances was uh, 2016A, uh, which encumbered the uh, Work Release Center out on w West Russell, the Juvenile Detention Center, and what we call land for expansion, but is the law enforcement center. Um, all the proceeds related to 2016 have been repaid. Um, so th these are all eligible to be removed from the existing ground lease, uh, which if, and if you accept the, or approve that resolution, um, that would um, pave the way for us to um, declare the work release center as a surplus property and for it to be sold. So our recommendation is to approve the resolution that would authorize the auditor to request that our trustee, which is U.S. Bank, uh, to amend the ground lease by removing the those properties. Thank you. Are there any questions, any questions? for Ben? Okay, look for a motion. I'd make a motion to approve. A second. We have a motion and a second. We have a roll call vote. Chair, I just for comment oh, mm -hmm. that just because it's clear that we could sell it doesn't mean we're going to sell it. Just don't well, don't rush out and you know with torches and pitchforks yeah. thinking we're going to sell <laughs> that. Property. No Good fire point. sale at this point. <laughs> um, roll call vote, please. Five. Aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Item number eighteen is consider a. Consider bid results and award recommendations for project number MC2102, microsurfacing and crack sealing, and authorize the chairman to sign the agreement with Asphalt Surfacing Technologies Corporation. The bids were opened on February 24th, 2021. Jacob, hi. Commissioners, nice Jacob Mars from the Highway Department. Um, first of four items I have for you is this one to award the microsurfacing and crack seal project to, to Aztec. <coughs> bids came in really good this year. Numbers were actually below what 29, 19 numbers were. Mm -hmm. And we had estimated under what our total budget would be to <laughs> allow for some movement in the department. So um, for our 2021 micro budget, we had 1.4 million, which leaves uh, a surplus of around 300,000 for this particular area. Any questions? Look for a motion. So moved. Second. A motion and a second. Roll call vote. Aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. Item number 19 is consider a bid results and award recommendation for project MC2105 chip seal and crack seal and authorize the chairman to sign the agreement with Asphalt Service Technologies Corporation. The bids opened February 24th. Same type of deal. Uh, prices came in really good this year um, in this particular area. So we had 2.29 million budgeted for our pavement preservation overall. And we didn't know what the split was going to be between our microsurfacing job and our chip seal job. So that's why there's quite a bit more saving in this, in this one based on what our 2021 budget was in 2020. So that's why there's a surplus of 492,820. There's no questions. I look for motion. Motion to approve uh, the award pre recommendation for chip seal and crack on uh, MC21-05. Second. Motion and a second. Roll call vote. Aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. Item number 20 is authorize the chairman to sign design services agreements between Minneapolis County and the Civil Design Inc. for the project MC21-09 structure number 50-279-140 rehab. This structure is located on County Highway 130, which would be north of Corson about two miles and then uh, west about a tenth of a mile. Um, <clears throat> last year there was some funding made available by the state for preservation. We applied for two of these projects. This is the first of two. Um, this contract that we're entering into is only utilizing a small portion of the grant that we were awarded. This is just for the design and then later on after the design is done then we will utilize the construction portion of that budget and we will also we have a 20 percent match on this so we will do our 20% match on this project this year for design, and then construction will be two years out. Two years out. Okay. Any questions? Motion? I'll make a motion to approve this contract. I'll second. 
Motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. Item number 21 is authorize the chairman to sign design services agreements between Minneapolis County and Civil Design Inc. for projects MC21-10, structures number 50-330-066 rehab. Very similar project. Um, this one, deck replacement and uh, guardrail replacement, which is what the other one needed as well. St structures in very good condition except for those couple of items, so it was a good candidate for preservation. It's just south of Sherman there <coughs> on County Highway 103. Um, the design is this contract, and then construction will actually be bid this fall and in the spring, and that'll be a separate, a separate contract. It's still amazing how much it cost. Yeah, and you say this was a simple project. I'm looking at the cost, which is 1.2 million dollars total. 1.2 million, yeah, and we only oh. we only cost participate in that for 20 percent, so it's a pretty right. good deal for us. It's a very. And good if you deal. look right below there, to replace the whole structure would be two one is our estimate. So, it's a pretty good deal for us. Yeah, it's a very good deal. Madam Chair, and Appreciate we only it. have uh, 99 bridges at two million bucks each. <clears throat> anyway, um, motion. I'll make that motion to approve. I'll second with just a comment. Yep. I just would note that, I mean, these are all, I mean, every single one of these are really great news for the citizens of Minnehaha County. I mean, we've got really good pricing on the first two projects and then being able to participate in these programs that um, are offered with this match really allows us to take the county tax dollars and get a lot of bang for our buck. So I appreciate the work you did on that. Thank you. So I have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Um, item number 22 is consider a resolution to participate in the bridge reinspection program using South Dakota Department of Transportation bridge replacement funds to hire Civil Design, Inc. Shannon. Good morning. Hi, good morning, commissioners. So this is an annual program we do every year. Uh, in the past, we've had a variety of consultants, but CDI, Civil Design Inc., has been doing our work for us the past couple years, and they've, they've been doing a good job. Similar to other state participation projects, our match is 20%. We don't have a, a cost estimate yet because this is for inspections to occur in 2021. Uh, we're going to do the west side this year. There's a few more bridges on the east side, which was done last year, and that contract was 106000 so I, I anticipate this this will be somewhere around that hundred ninety to hundred thousand dollars. <coughs> so uh, that's what we're asking for you today is to approve and sign the resolution, which enables us to participate in the state bridge inspection program. Okay. Any questions for Shannon? I make a motion to approve. Second. Motion and a second. Roll call vote. Sorry. Aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. Thanks, Shannon, for Thanks, coming over. Item number 23 is the Minnehaha County Liaison Reports. Any reports? I think all my reports were covered by other people today. No, so. that's what I was sure. thinking. I would just comment that I had a UDC meeting last week, and uh, uh, it seems like we never get to really do much there. We, they give us stuff, and they say, please approve, and then we all vote to approve it. Well, I brought up an issue which I'd like us to uh, push the state DOT on, which is to put up sound barriers on Highway 11, otherwise known as 101, where currently is a motorcycle racing track. And uh, I live a half mile away. I can hear it clearly. The people that live right there must be miserable. And uh, we did that on Highway 29, uh, and it was to good benefit, I believe. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Jeff. Um, I'd also mention that today or tomorrow starts the South Dakota Association of County Commissioners Re Convention. Um, Commissioner Karski and myself will both be attending. We have the um, Board of Directors meeting is this afternoon, late this afternoon in Pier, and so we will be up there. Um, and item number 24 is new business. Madam Chair. Commissioner Bart. I just want to bring up a couple things which are one, I think going forward, we need to really strategize. I'm a short timer. I've got like a year and a half before I'm, I'm well, I won't be dead, but I <laughs> won't be getting anything done. So I think we need to look at the issue of home rule for Minnehaha County. I think we need to brainstorm how to spend monies that we have and what our strategies are for building. And um, I hope that we find the time to get that done. I've 
seen a couple of uh, possibilities for home rule charter and uh, you know basically it gives the, the county the right to do anything not forbidden by the state because they pretty much you know put the cuffs on us and I'm only bringing this forward not to take away your guns, not to uh, uh, ban churches. It's to actually just make our county function better. We are no longer a ma and pa operation. We need to operate with high professionalism and uh, in the best interest of all the people in our region. Thank you, Commissioner Burr. Anything? Um, no more new, new business. Is there any old business? Okay, let's see, with that, we don't have any executive session today, so I would- Adjourn. Second. I have a motion and a second to adjourn. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. We are adjourned.